The Story of Anne Frank by Stuart Cross, illustrated by Alan Marks. Mrs. Frank woke Anne at dawn. She explained to her daughter that they could not take any luggage with them. The police would know that a Jew carrying a suitcase was trying to escape, and Anne could take only her school satchel and the clothes she was wearing. Anne had already crammed her satchel full of her favorite possessions, including Kitty. She now dressed as if she were going to the North Pole. Two pairs of stockings, two camisoles, three pairs of panties, a dress, a skirt, a jacket, a coat, shoes, a wool cap, and a scarf. Feeling like a giant bear, Anne went to the window and looked out. Thank goodness. The hot weather had ended, and thin drizzle was falling from a gray sky. At 7.30, Anne said goodbye to Morty and followed her parents out into the wet street. Although she had no idea where they were going, she didn't mind. She knew they would be safe. At the moment, that was all that mattered. The family made their way through the city to the building where Mr. Frank worked. Making sure no one was watching, they slipped inside and went upstairs to the office. They climbed another flight of stairs, turned right, and, to Anne's amazement, they were suddenly inside the secret apartment that Mr. Frank had been preparing for his family. For a time, Anne forgot her fear. It was such an adventure. Once she had unpacked her things and decorated her room with pictures of movie stars, she thought that her new home was the most comfortable hiding place in all of Holland. What's more, she had something to look forward to. The Franks were to share their hideaway with the Van Pels family. Peter Van Pels was 15. Anne couldn't wait to meet him. The Nazis were now rounding up Jews all over Holland, and many Dutch people risked their lives by helping them escape or go into hiding. Several people working in the building knew about the Jews in the secret apartment. Victor Kogler and Johannes Kielman knew. So did Mip and John Geese and Ben Voskogil and his father. The Secret World through thin curtains, the autumn sunshine flooded into the small room. Anne, seated at the table, stared at the numbers in Mr. Kugler's book. She had to add up 25 columns, each with 32 numbers in it. What a bore! But it was thanks to Mr. Kugler and his friends that they were still alive. Helping with their bookkeeping was the least she could do. She took a deep breath and started to add the columns of figures. 5 plus 32 equals 37 plus 9 makes... Anne, have you brushed your hair this morning? It was her mother's voice nagging. Anne felt anger rising within her, still staring at the figure, she said slowly. Mom, how many times do I have to tell you that I'm 13 now? I don't need a babysitter. I'm trying to work. I know that, dear, replied Mrs. Frank, but just because we're in hiding, it doesn't mean we shouldn't take care of ourselves. Hear, hear, chimed in Mrs. Van Pels from the other side of the room. Anne thought her head would explode. Leave me alone, she muttered through gritted teeth. We've been here more than a year and all we do is argue. All day, every day, I hate it. I hate all of you. I want to run away. She slammed down her pencil and stamped into the tiny room she shared with Margot. Throwing herself on her bed, she buried her face in her hands, sobbing loudly. Everything had gone wrong. Peter had turned out to be boring. She badly missed her old friend, especially Hanley. Now she had only Kitty to share her secrets with. They were all trapped in the secret apartment like chickens in a coop. They got on each other's nerves. They were short of food, soap, clothes, and terrified of the dreaded knock on the door. Later, her father came to talk to her. He spoke softly and kindly. He knew it was difficult, terribly difficult, to live like this, 
but at least they were alive and safe. There was hope too, he explained. In a short time, maybe in the next few months, British and American troops would cross the channel and drive the Nazis from Holland. They must be patient. They had survived one year so they could survive another. Anne put her hand on her father's shoulder. Do you believe that, Daddy? Do you really think we will be free soon? The seven Jews living in the secret apartment were joined on November 16, 1942 by an eighth Fritz Pfeffer. They all did what they could do to help their Dutch protectors. In addition to bookkeeping work, they filled gravy packets and took the stones out of cherries. Fall dragged into winter and winter into spring. Still, the war raged on, and still the small group of Jews remained shut away from the world. But now, there was real hope. Everywhere, the Nazis were in retreat. The Russians were driving them back in the east and, step by step, they were being forced out of Italy. Anne was more relaxed too. As she neared her 15th birthday, she was fast becoming a young woman. She was annoyed when others still treated her as a child, but she learned not to react. Besides, she had a new joy in her life. Over the long months together, she had come to see Peter in a different light. There was more to him than she had realized. He was not as clever as her, but he was calmer. She grew to like him more and more. Peter was desperately shy. Day by day, sitting with him in the attic where he worked, she encouraged him to talk. And the more he talked, the fonder she became of him. In time, her fondness grew to love. She told Kitty that for the first time in years, she felt really happy. In June came the wonderful news that British and American troops had landed in France. Freedom seemed only weeks away. On the morning of August 4, Victor Kugler was disturbed by a loud knocking on his office door. Before he could answer, a group of armed men burst in. The leader wore the unmistakable uniform of a Nazi policeman. Don't say a word. We know everything. Take us to the Jews. Kugler hesitated. The Nazi raised his pistol. Now, Kugler. No trouble, please. Kugler led the way to the bookcase that hid the door to the secret apartment. It's behind there, he said. The two men pushed the bookcase aside. At first, Anne thought it was a dream. There they all were, her parents, Margot, Mr. and Mrs. Van Pels, Peter, and Mr. Pfeffer, standing with their backs to the wall, terrified. Had two years of miserable hiding really been in vain? Bring me all your valuables, ordered the policeman in his thick Austrian accent. Then he gave them five minutes to pack. Your vacation is over, he added sarcastically. It's time you joined other Jews and did something useful. Clutching her tattered satchel, Anne was hurried down the stairs and pushed toward a waiting truck. A small crowd had gathered on the street to see what was going on. As Anne passed, an old woman stepped forward and touched her lightly on the arm. Good luck, my dear, she whispered. Before Anne could reply, she was bundled into the truck with the others and had driven off to prison. Before the war, about 130,000 Jews lived in Holland. The Nazis killed 100,000 of them. They also made thousands of Dutch men and women work in German factories. The city of Amsterdam was not freed until May 1945. It was now six months since the Franks had been captured. A bitter wind howled through the barbed wire fence of Belsen concentration camp. Nearby, hundreds of women prisoners were crammed into a wooden hut. Sick and starving, they were stacked like garbage bags in filthy bunk beds. The door cracked open. A girl entered and looked about her. Pulling a thin shawl closer around her bony shoulders, she knelt and whispered to one woman, Anne Frank? Do you know where I can find Anne Frank? The 
old woman stared at her blankly for a moment. Then she lifted an arm no thicker than a stick and pointed to a far corner. The visitor thanked her and shuffled across the room. Hanley? Hanley Gosler? Anne's voice could scarcely be heard above the noise of the wind. Is it really you? Why are you here? Hanley forced her to a smile. Yes, Anne, darling. It's your old friend from Amsterdam. Look, I brought you something. She placed a small package of food on the grimy straw of Anne's mattress. When her friend stretched out a hand toward it, Hanley saw that the thin fingers were covered in sores. Tell me, Hanley, where am I? Anne asked. Is it Ostwich? No, my dear. They have moved you to another camp. A look of pain came into Anne's eyes. But Mommy and Daddy are at Ostwich. I want to see them. She made a sobbing sound, but no tears came. Hanley grasped her hand. Don't cry, Anne. It will soon be over, and then you will be with them again. Anne slowly closed her eyes. Soon be over? Yes, thank God. It will soon be over. Hanley stayed with Anne until she was sure that she was asleep. Then kissing her friend lightly on the forehead, she went into the night. The Frank family was taken first to Westerbork camp, then to the Auschwitz concentration camp. Here, the men and women were separated. At the end of October 1944, Anne and Margot, both seriously ill, were moved to Belsen. Margot died sometime in March, and Anne just a few days later. British troops reached Belsen on April 15, 1945. Edith Frank, Anne's mother, died in Auschwitz on January 6, 1945. Mr. and Mrs. Van Fels, Peter, and Mr. Pepper also died at the hands of the Nazis. Otto Frank, Anne's father was the only one from the secret department to survive. The Russians rescued him from Auschwitz. On January 27, 1945, it took him seven months to find out what had happened to Margot and Anne. We do not know exactly how many Jews the Nazis killed during the war. It was probably about six million, the greatest slaughter in human history. After the Franks had been taken prisoner, Mip Kiss went to the secret apartment and found Anne's diary. She kept it, hoping to give it back after the war. When she learned that Anne was dead, she gave it to Otto Frank. In 1947, he arranged for it to be published in Dutch. Since then, it has been translated into more than 50 languages and read by millions of people. Thanks to Anne's young talent, her memories, and that of all other victims of Nazi racism will live forever.